by the end of this video, you'll know how to facilitate an effective retrospective with a large group of people, both online and offline. By large group, I mean more than a team. More than 15 people. If you want to know how to facilitate an effective retrospective or sprint retrospective for a team, watch this video right here. All the tips, tricks I will mention in this video will all be about facilitating a retrospective for a large group. That's the focus of this video. First, let's define retrospective. What's the goal of a retrospective? It's quite simple. A retrospective is any time a group of people meet to reflect on the past with a goal of improving the future. Improving the future. Now, before talking about how to facilitate a retrospective, we need to understand why a retrospective with a large group is so different than one with a small group or a team. Number one, the conversation atmosphere. When you do a retrospective, a sprint retrospective, or any kind of retrospectives with a team, we all know each other. We can openly speak with each other, assuming that we are in a safe environment. It's a psychologically safe team. We trust each other. We can speak with each other. But in a large group, different teams, maybe different companies working together, are we truly safe? There's a higher chance that people are not safe, that they don't trust each other but they want to speak up during the sprint retrospective, which is understandable. But your priority as a facilitator is to focus on psychological safety, is to focus on trust. It was always the priority, even when facilitating retros for a team only, but with a large group, it's even more important. <laughs> your priority is psychological safety, trust, ensuring that everyone can share equally and it will be a hard thing to do because there's a higher chance that people don't trust each other one of the things i've noticed from the years is with a large group people can easily withdraw from the conversation yeah they tell you they are sharing they tell you they want to share but slowly gradually during the retrospective they withdraw from the conversation and it's hard to notice that as a facilitator because with a large group Sometimes it's chaos. So many leaders in the group talking over each other. You need to try to give an opportunity to everyone to share equally. But some people are hiding and you don't see that as a facilitator. So please, your number one priority, psychological safety, trust, and ensuring that everyone has a voice. Everyone can share equally. Now, before setting the meeting, scheduling the retrospective, one last attempt of cancelling it. <laughs> you need to try. You see, in the Scrum Guide, the latest version of the Scrum Guide is recommended by the Scrum team. Around 10 people. Yeah, small team. And that's for a reason. There's a purpose behind that. In the retrospective also, it's the same logic. 10 people are simply more manageable than a large group. 15 people, 20 people, 30 people. So please, if you can keep your retrospective to only 10 people, 15 people, do it. One of the things that I see people often do, Scrum Masters and your coaches, is taking, is asking one representative from each one of the teams involved. Come to the retrospective representing the team. You have a small committee, people that can represent the team and that can share equally. Way more, way easier to manage as a facilitator. But the actual input, is it better or not? The output that you'll get, I don't know. You need to try it, but I still recommend as far as possible, keep retrospectives under 10 people. It will be more effective. Another thing that you should keep in mind prior to scheduling the retro is understanding and ensuring that you understand the topic and that people can actually share. <laughs> Multiple teams maybe will be in this retro. Can they actually share? Or is the information being shared confidential? Hmm. Find this out. It's really important. You're now ready to schedule the retro. How much time should the retro be? Well, it depends on the context. Why are we even doing a retrospective? Maybe a release went wrong and we're doing a release retrospective or a sprint retrospective or any kind of retrospective. It really depends. If you look at the team, it's recommended that we spend, I think, one hour, one and a half hours on sprint retrospective for a team of 10 people. I don't usually spend that much. I spend one hour. I'm used to it. It's effective. But that's for 10 people. 20 people. Hmm. It starts becoming complex. For 20 people, I would say two hours. 90 minutes or two hours. 
at least your first time. Obviously, for a two-hour session, take a break in between. The worst thing you can do is schedule a retrospective for one hour when there's 20 people on the call. <laughs> You will feel rushed. There's no way this meeting will be effective. Now that you've scheduled the retro, let's talk about the format. I use a simple format. First, icebreaker, psychological safety check, and then explain why are we here? Why are we even having a retrospective? And what's the goal of a retrospective? Mm -hmm. Really important. You can also go through the prime directive I'm displaying on the screen right here. Please pause the video and read it understand it. It's related to psychological safety. If you want to know how to handle different results in terms of psychological safety, watch this video right here. But my first, that's the first step, setting the stage. The second step is covering the data. Here you will ask people, okay? Let's say we are here to reflect on a problem, something that didn't go as expected. And we want some learnings from that. If you're on site, post-it notes, sticky notes, one idea per card, good and writing, <laughs> and give 10 minutes for everyone to share their ideas on what can be improved. What they want to talk about in this retrospective, what they reflected on, what learnings can be gained from this particular situation that happened, maybe. If you're doing it online, use Miro.com or any other whiteboard tools available. There's tons. One common mistake I see facilitators doing is asking people to write their priority learnings, priority opportunities to improve. Now, freely, openly, everyone should be able to share what they want. The gathering phase is for everyone to not be thinking about what's the most important thing I want to share. No, we don't care about that. What's the most important thing? There will be a voting stage afterwards. But when gathering data, you share everything. If someone wants to write 20 cards in 10 minutes, let them write 20 cards in 10 minutes. You can't run the gathering data phase same as you would with a small group. There's a large group, let's say 30 people in a room. It will be chaos. I like using the structure, simple structure, one to four, I think it's called from liberating structures. You can check the description of this video for more details on how to do it. But it's really simple. So first, individually, you reflect individually, one minute, two minutes, then you join your group. Obviously, the facilitator split a large group of 30 people into small groups and you discuss with your group. You remove duplicates. Maybe I think there's too many bugs. And John also thinks there's too many bugs. We won't be writing two cards, too many bugs. A single card. So when discussing in group, you're already removing the duplicates. Then as a group, you come up with a list of things that you want to talk about. Obviously, you removed all the duplicates. Then you come to a wall, a board, and you stick everything on there. The second phase is merging everything together. First, you read all the cards or you get someone else, even better, you get someone else to read all the cards or multiple people and then ask the question, do you want more details for each one of these cards? If you want more details, ask the question. If something is not clear, ask the question. And once everything is clear, once everyone has read all the cards, clearly understand, we need to group the cards together. And you let people also do that or help you do that. Build small sections on the wall. Maybe there's a theme, psychological safety. People feel that what they need to improve is psychological safety. People don't feel safe. So you create a little section, psychological safety on the wall, and you put, take all post-its related to psychological safety, and you place them on the wall. Again, you're asking people. You're not deciding for the team. You don't know what groups to create or what should be in these groups. You're asking people and you're placing them in these groups. Once this is done, Votes, maybe three votes per person. Small little dots where they want to vote. Only three votes per person, no cheating. <laughs> and then you start talking about the things that are priority, got the most votes. Now, this is where it becomes tricky, facilitating the session with a large group. I like using an open space format. So in a nutshell, it's really simple. You let them self-organize around what was voted. So. Let's take the votes in terms of priority and let's start discussing about the topics. If you want to talk about topic A, you go into group A and you let people self-organize what group A would be. Topic B, you go into group B, each different section separated in the room. If you're using Miro and Zoom, OMS Teams, Microsoft Teams, you can create breakout sessions. But let people self-organize. And one key rule is that people can freely move from one room to another. If you're good, I'm bored with A. I've already shared with A. I'm not interested in listening to people. I can go into room B. 
to talk about another topic. He set the timer for 15 minutes, you let them talk, and all the actions from each one of these sections will be dropped down on the wall or on Miro, and you select owners for each one of these actions, same as you would for a normal retrospective. And as a facilitator, you're moving around. You're moving around, going throughout the breakout sessions to facilitate discussions. The more the facilitators, the better. But if you're alone, it's still possible. If you want more tips, insights on Agile Scrum personal growth, click on the video that stands out the most on the screen right now, and I'll see you in a few seconds.